the world of paganism is full of captivating and sometimes mysterious deities. Depending on where you look, there's an endless array of different gods wading through the waves of history, sifting through the sands of time and revealing themselves to us in ancient inscriptions, stories and human traditions. It is also a world that is so vast that it can be challenging to know where to begin. And that's where this video comes in. This is by no means a complete list of every single pagan god, as to attempt a feat such as that would prove beyond the means of any mortal being. This is, instead, a starting point to pagan deities, to discover which ones may interest or speak to you personally. And if you are already well versed in paganism, maybe you'll discover a new path to travel down. With all that said, presented in alphabetical order, here is a brief introduction to 54 Pagan Gods. Amun, meaning the Hidden One, is first mentioned in the Pyramid Texts of the 5th Dynasty as a member of the Ogdoad, a group of eight primordial deities, arranged into four groups of male and female responsible for creation. He is usually represented as a man wearing a double feathered crown or as a ram, but has also been depicted as a goose, an ape, or a man with the head of a frog or a crocodile. His origins are uncertain, possibly in Heliopolis, the center of the Ogdoad, or in the Nubian center of Jabal Barkal in North Sudan. Certainly, by the time of the 11th dynasty, he had replaced Monthu, the falcon-headed god of war as the patron god of Thebes. His consort was Amunet, a feminized form of the same name who may or may not have been seen as a separate deity. Most people will have heard of Angus Og in the context of the Irish god of love, music and poetry, the youngest son of the Daedda and the goddess Bon for whom the River Boyne is named. Irish myth states that Daedda desired Bon, so he sent her husband to a distant part of his kingdom whilst he seduced her. When Bon conceived, Daedda caused time to stand still. Angus was therefore conceived, gestated, and born in one day. It is from this legend that his name arises. He is the ever young. However, there is a less well-known side of Angus Org. One that seems to be much older and to belong to a time when neither Scotland nor Ireland yet existed. Stories of Angus moved across those lands, once known as the Kingdom of Daulida. The traditional role of the storytellers, the Shenachi, meant Angus's stories survived in various forms, not all of them fossilized in ink. Anubis is one of the oldest Egyptian gods, whose roots stretch far back past the pre-dynastic age to the jackal shamans of circa 20,000 BCE, whose images were found in Egyptian caves in the 20th century. Anubis was usually depicted as a jackal, or wild dog-headed man, or a reclining black jackal. Anubis was the great protector god, guiding the soul through the underworld and even protecting other gods during their disputes. He was also the Lord of Embalming, and through this is connected with incense and perfumery. To this day, as the light of the Greek pantheon, Apollo remains one of the most beloved by both gods and humans alike. As a deity of archery, art, knowledge, light, medicine, music, plague, sun, and of oracles, his domain is vast reaching. His influence and role in society is one of the most important in the world of the ancient Greeks. He also remains the only deity that, upon adoption into the Roman pantheon, kept his own name. Artuis is a Celtic tribal god. While some believe he is named after the town Artex, it is more commonly believed that he is a bear god. The name Artuis seems to derive from the Celtic word art, meaning bear, aligning him with the goddess Artio, a statue of whom can be found in the Swiss city of Bern. 
Artuis is referred to in a single Romo-Celtic inscription from the Isaiah region of eastern France, over the border from the cult of the bear goddess in Switzerland. The inscription reads, To the August Mercury Artuis, his name becoming an epithet to the god Mercury from the Roman pantheon. The practice of using the names of Celtic gods as epithets was common during the Roman period, with Artuis being one of the nearly 300 deities remembered this way. Asclepius the physician was originally a historical figure in ancient Greece. He was so skillful at healing the sick that after his death he was deified, also acquiring a god. Apollo for a father. The myth of Asclepius is connected with the origins of medical science and the healing arts. After his death, he became a god and people believed that he had the power to cure them. So they began to build temples to honor him. As the sick lay dreaming, the god Asclepius came to them and told them how to be cured. The patient then related their dream to the priest who provided treatment and an explanation of the dream. Aten is the term used in Egyptian inscriptions for the sun disk, the physical, visible manifestation of the solar deities. In earlier times, it was not viewed as a god in its own right. The first mention of Aten as a god is in the 12th dynasty, story of Sinue, where the murdered pharaoh ascends to the heavens to merge with the Aten. It was not unusual for a dynasty to choose a patron deity, and the 18th dynasty associated itself particularly with the solar deities, with Aten becoming increasingly important. Amenhotep III seems to have developed the cult of the Aten, using Tejekan Aten, Radiance of the Aten, as one of his epithets. For anyone familiar with the Hebrew Bible, Baal is an infamous name, the adversary of Yahweh. A multitude of Old Testament verses chronicle the war waged by Yahweh to turn his people away from the worship of the false lord of the earth. Much of what we know about Baal comes from a series of fragmented texts discovered in the ancient city of Ugarit, known as the Baal Cycle. The son of the goddess Atharat and the god of the crops, Dagon, Although some texts call him the son of El, the supreme god of the Canaan, Baal was the archetypal fertility god, whose blessed rains allowed the grain to grow, the livestock to flourish, and the community to prosper. In the ancient city of Bath, in Somerset, UK, stands the Roman Baths, built over a natural hot spring, the site also hosts several nods to deity, but also a strange gorgon relief that some believe represents the god Belenus. He is generally seen as a sun god with healing powers, although little evidence suggests he was specifically a sun god originally. Perhaps due to his associations with fire, the fire festival of Beltane, healing, and the sun rays around his images, he has been thought of as such. However, he is believed to be a god of light, health, and healing, which often links him to healing waters, wells, and springs. He is also associated with agriculture, and specifically, cattle. He is one of the deities that is thought to traverse the sky in a horse-drawn carriage, bringing the sun with him or riding upon it in some stories. The god whom we now know as Bess may have begun as a variety of other protector deities who were all eventually assimilated into the dwarf lion Bess. Bess is portrayed as a dwarf god with leonine features. He has short legs, an enlarged head with a beard, and a protruding tongue. Bess is often shown with a lion's mane, lion's tail, or wearing the skin of a lion. Sometimes Bess is shown with a large belly and breasts, perhaps to indicate his protection over pregnant women. In his hands, he carries the tools of his trade. Images of Bess show him carrying rattles and other musical instruments that he would use to scare away demons, 
intent upon causing harm. Bess is one of only two ancient Egyptian deities portrayed fully facing the observer. Most Egyptian deities are portrayed in profile. Rai is widely recognized as a member of the Aesir, the Norse god of poetry and the patron god of skalds. What we do know for certain is that Brahi is one of the very few of the Aesir or Valnir who is welcome no matter which realm he finds himself to be in, and was also one of the few non-warrior gods within the Aesir. This can be seen in his lack of weapons or other war-related objects as a symbol. Rather, his symbol is that of a harp. Differing stories about him have the dwarfs gifting Brahi with a golden harp. Bran is one of the few truly British gods who can trace his ancestry to pre-Celtic times. Usually referred to as Bran the Blessed or Bran the Fandigate in Welsh, that literally means blessed crow or raven. He was a legendary king of Britain and a fearless warrior, a popular figure in the bardic traditions and well known in Welsh mythology during the Iron Age. Legend describes him as a giant of semi-divine heritage who possessed supernatural strengths and abilities. His father was Thlia, the god of the sea, and he was also brother to Branwen, of whom he was fiercely protective. A patron of poetry and music, Bran was hailed as the personification of sovereignty, eventually being venerated as a god, a hero, and a powerful king among the numerous tribes of Britain where he was associated with ravens as a god of prophecy. The Tale of Bless appears in the Labor Goblana, the Irish Book of Invasions. The stories within the Labor Goblana hold only a memory of the original tales, which would have been passed on through word of mouth over generations and embellished with each retelling. Brez, also known as Yochej Brez, is described as beautiful, but harsh and inhospitable. Some versions of his story say he was married to the goddess Bridget, which suggests she may have originally been a sovereignty goddess, who represented the land and legitimized a king by marrying and or having sex with him. Kelnonos is possibly one of the better known gods in modern and neo-paganism. The archetypal image of the horned god is particularly potent in religions such as a wicca. The horned god is often seen as the consort to the goddess, both her son and lover at differing points in the cycle of her story, and a symbol of death and rebirth. Kelnonos reminds us of our links to nature, and that we are a part of nature. So to disrespect the natural world is to disrespect ourselves. He is the hibernating mammal in winter, the green buds in spring, the thriving forest in summer, and the mice that run from the combine harvester during early autumn. He is every creature from the smallest to the most massive, from woodlouse to whale, and as a primal, fertile god, he is the embodiment of love, sex, and creativity, which needn't be limited by gender or sexuality. As early as the 13th century BCE, the name of Dionysus was being spoken amongst the Mycenaeans, and while, in later years, he has come to be misunderstood as simply a hedonist. This multi-dimensional deity has ancient beginnings and deep importance. Due to his complicated genesis, Dionysus was blessed with many attributes which reflect his history. A reincarnated god of vegetation, fruitfulness and wine, he also presided over vast celebrations and accompanying performance arts. This is then taken further by his close association with drunkenness, ecstasy, orgiastic rites and madness. Over the years, many people have focused on the connections to wine and ecstatic celebration, and this led many to discount the god as a light-hearted party animal, 
when in reality he was considered bestial, but in a way more closely related to fertility and the complex mystery of nature. Once believed to be little more than a synonym for God, a chance discovery in the ancient city of Ugarit in 1928 reintroduced the powerful Canaanite supreme god to the modern world. El was not simply a god, but the god. Frequently portrayed as an older man with a long grey beard, El was the progenitor of gods and men, the creator eternal, the god of wisdom, the bull god of immense strength and uncommon compassion. No temples dedicated to the bull god have ever been unearthed, but his name is prominent on surviving lists of sacrificial offerings. This may be because he was worshipped primarily in tents in the wilderness, like the one he and his family withdrew to for eight years after the birth of Shahar and Shalim. Despite this, numerous bull icons believed to have been used in the worship of El have been unearthed, along with inscriptions and hymns written in his honor. He may have been a distant god, but his presence was felt throughout the Canaanite world. Ever her Jaeger, to those of the Uglave faith, is an earthbound deity in the myths of the Pennsylvania Dutch. He is known for having saved the people who settled the farms around the Bublalik from starvation. Using his hounds to drive game to the land the farmers had stripped bare. Whenever her Jaeger is depicted, he is generally seen as horned or antlered with his hounds surrounding him. He is likened to Hearn the Hunter, and the association is strong enough for some people to refer to Everher Jaeger as Hearn. Some view the pre-thunder rumble of the sky as the baying of his hounds. Everher Jaeger is seen as a woodland figure, directing game toward or away from humans as suits his mood. Everher is called upon whenever human efforts or resources are not quite enough. When everything has been tried, he hears the pleas. He can be called upon when you are truly in need, as the strong, stoic father of the woods. We have more named fairy queens than kings, but we do have a few examples of named kings as well. In Ireland, one of the most well-known of the fairy kings is Fimbarila. His fairy hill is at Nochmeda in County Galway and he is known as the King of the Fairies of Connacht. He also has a strong connection to the dead, and in some folklore, he is the King of the Dead. The relationship between the fairies and the dead is complicated, but we also see this sort of crossover with Don Filoni, who is called both a fairy king and a god of the dead. We shouldn't conflate the two groups entirely, but this may indicate that Fimbrilila has a chthonic nature. Physical descriptions of Fimbalila are rare, but the meaning of his name would indicate that he is fair-haired. He is also considered a handsome man, often described as wearing black. Beyond these few details, we could only surmise, but antidotal accounts would indicate an attractive and imposing figure. Gwythian gets a lot of undeserved bad press that comes from lots of moral misunderstandings and prejudices, so people are unable to see him as he truly is, for he really is the master enchanter of Britain. We need to learn to dig deep below the agendas and prejudices that surround us in our daily lives. We need to be awake and aware so we don't fall for all the machinations of politics, peer groups and normalcy around us. The Master Enchanter of Britain is a good friend and a brilliant teacher for this. Read his stories in as many versions as you can find, and get rid of your own illusions about him, brought on by the bad press the Victorian story collectors give him. Who is Gwyn? 
the legend tells how he lives under Glastonbury Tor slash the Isles of Avalon. He emerges at Samhain, riding with the wild hunt across the land, riding with his warriors and hounds. He re-enters his underground home, each Beltane, before emerging again the following Samhain. He is also the king of the Fey, the folk who live under the hill with him. And if you enter his realm, you must not eat or drink anything offered, or you will not be able to leave. Hamulman is the monkey-headed god mentioned in the Ramayana, one of the two major Sanskrit Hindu texts. He is the devoted friend to Lord Rama, an incarnation of Vishnu and a protector god. In some traditions, he is considered an incarnation or avatar of Shiva. Hanuman served as a dedicated friend to Rama and his family. Most notably, during a great battle, Hanuman was sent to gather healing herbs to treat the wounded, which included Lakshman, Ramana's brother, when it was clear that picking the herbs would cost time they didn't have. Hanuman uprooted the entire mountain and brought it back to the ailing. To worship Hanuman is to seek protection against evil spirits and evil humans, aid concentration and wit, and to gain power over one's enemies. Harpar Klat is the Egyptian god of silence. He is referred to as Horus the Child, often presented as a young boy sitting or standing on top of a lotus flower. The tip of his index finger rests upon his lips. In the Golden Dawn initiation, Harpar Klat is used as a reminder to keep your oath of secrecy. Hephaestus would often be referred to as the smith god or the ugly craftsman with a limp. But as with all the Greek pantheon, Hephaestus is so much more than that. As the god of the blacksmiths, metalworking, carpenters, craftsmen, artisans, sculptors, metallurgy, fire and volcanoes, he is a potent and driven creative force. His divine parentage is either that he is the son of Zeus and Hera or that he was born of Hera alone. The latter myth sometimes being interpreted that Hera attempted to create offspring without the aid of her husband. Like Zeus managed with the birth of Athena, it is what led to the deformity and disability that was instantly noticeable. Hermes is predominantly recognized as a messenger god, but was also revered as an underworld god and a psychopomp responsible for guiding the souls of the dead, including bringing Persephone back from Hades to delight her mother and reignite Earth's growth. Along with Hecate, Hermes is the only god given the power to move between the below Hades, Earth, and the above Olympus. For this reason, some Hellenic pagans may work with Hermes to increase their ability to speak with spirits, have visitations, and even in funerary rites to guide their loved ones to the afterlife. Throughout the history and folklore of Europe, there are many variations on the wild huntsman myth. Many of these tell of a ghostly warrior leading a moonlit hunt a Celtic forest guardian left to haunt a great oak. In Anglo-Saxon belief, Hearn was seen as more of a deity than a ghost. But later, as Christianity gained popularity, the tales of the hunt became more fearsome and violent, cementing the connection between this life and the next. Hypnos was a winged young man who dwelt in the land of eternal darkness beyond the gates of the rising sun, known as Erebos. Each night, he would rise into the sky, following in the train of his mother, the goddess Nyx. He was often seen alongside his twin brother, Thanatos, and it was said that the Oneroi were either his brothers or sons. Inale is one of the most popular of the Japanese gods and possibly the most complex, with more than one third of the Shinto shrines being dedicated to him, son of the impetuous storm god. 
to Sono, he is the protector of rice cultivation, furthering prosperity, and worshipped by merchants and tradesmen. He is also the patron deity of swordsmiths and associated with brothels and entertainers, as well as being an all-round general problem solver. Represented as male or female, he is identified with Ukano Mitama no Kame and with the goddess of food, Uke Mochi mo Kame. Usually when referring to Inare, the two general images are of an old man sitting on a pile of rice with two foxes beside him, or of a beautiful fox woman. Originally depicted with masculine features, Quanan later appears with attributes of both genders and eventually becomes a symbol of the feminine divine in many East Asian countries, with each culture showing Quanan in different forms to suit their own temperaments and spiritual conceptions. Quanan is considered male in the Buddhist traditions of India, Tibet and Southeast Asia, but less so in Japan. Quanon's femininity is clearly compatible with Japanese religious sensibilities because unlike Buddhism, whose deities are generally genderless or male, Japan's Shinto religion has long revered the female element. The Emperor of Japan, even today, claims direct descent from Amatelus, so it's only natural that Quanon was given feminine attributes. Lo encompasses a divine energy that is hard to pin down. Due to his connection with the late summer festival of Lunasa, there can be a tendency to see Lo as a solar deity, but perhaps it is more accurate to see him as a deity of mastery rather than light. Not only skilled in the warrior arts, Lo is also said to be a master builder and craftsman, a smith, a poet, a harpist, and even with Manuman Maklea as his foster father, a sorcerer. Along with his unquestionable skill, Lu has the benefit of several magical items invaluable to a warrior. The Spear of Assail, said to be irrepressible in its thirst for battle and unfailing in its ability to hit its mark when a certain incarnation is said over it. Fakhalach, the sword of Manuman Maklea which speaks to the fondness between Lu and his foster father, and a mighty slingstone, which Lu uses to kill Balor, driving his slingstone so powerfully into Balor's eye that the eyeball is propelled towards the Fomorian army, wreaking terrible havoc on the opposing forces. Mabon is the divine youth of Welsh tradition. It is believed that his tale originated in pagan Celtic times and existed in oral tradition for centuries before being committed to writing in the medieval period. Because of this, like all figures in Welsh lore, he is not directly identified as a divinity in his stories. However, there are many clues which point to his divine nature, including the meaning of his full name, Mabon ap Madron which translates as Divine Youth, Son of the Divine Mother. We first meet Manawadun in the second branch of the Mabinogi as the brother of the High King Bran and their sister Branwen. Their mother is Panaradun, daughter of another ancestor god, Beli Mal. Manawadun accompanies Bran on his adventures in Ireland but his part in the action is not singled out. In the third branch, Manawadun is central to the story and we finally get to know him. After a devastating battle in the second branch, Manawadun is invited to the southern kingdom of the Fed by Patelli, the son of the famous horse sovereignty goddess, Rhiannon. Patelli offers Manawadun the kingdom of the Fed and the widowed Rhiannon's hand in marriage. He agrees and Patelli his wife, Kigfa, and the newlyweds quickly become firm friends. With so many Norse gods seemingly focused on battle and the trials of love, Manne offers a different perspective into the culture. As the personification of the moon, Manne arrives into mythology via the poetic Edda as translated by Snorle Sturluson and in the prose Edda, Manne is often written about in relation to his brother the sun or soul. Manne tells humans about time and about the passage of time, 
He was also invoked in Scandinavia, Germany, and England for spell work. In Halvermacht, Manne is related to both blessings and curses, while also being a protector of the dead and the living. He was also connected with seeing into the future, as well as with Saida practices of prophecy. Marduk is of Assyrio-Babylonian origin. He was the first son of Ea and Dankina, the earth goddess. Marduk is a god of spring, a god of agriculture, and the root of his name can be interpreted as Calf of the Storm, a storm god. He is also referred to as Bel in the Old Testament. He is connected with Ishtar as one of her named consorts and is also known as husband to Zaponitu. Marduk, as the patron of the city of Babylon, rose in ascendancy as Babylon the city prospered. As principal deity, Marduk embodied 50 other major deities, becoming virtually the sole god. God of death, infertility and drought. Mot ruled the darker chasms of the Canaanite underworld. Although we do not know much about Mot or his worship, texts discovered in the ancient city of Ugarit in modern day Syria provide a glimpse into the terrible figure of death, whose mouth was said to stretch from heaven to earth. Ruling from deep within the earth in his city, Hemri, Mot sat within a great pit, crushing and devouring anything that drew too close. His hunger was insatiable, and any that ventured near his mouth, even gods, did not return. Despite being Baal's adversary, Mot was never considered an evil god. Instead, the drama of Baal and Mot helped the people of Canaan understand the periods of devastating drought they often contended with. Like death, Mot was neither good or bad, but simply a force to be acknowledged and accepted. Nabor is the original messenger god who laid down God's law for humanity, converting from hunter-gatherers into city dwellers. He was the heir to the Anunnaki throne, a royal prince who was descended from the serpent bloodline of the gods. Nabu's father, the current king of the universe, Marduk was the son of the great wizard and lord of the earth. Enke, who was the son of Anu, who reigned over all of heaven, and father to all the gods and goddesses who conducted their business within the civilized human mind. Anu was the order born from the chaos of Mamu, who was born from the union of the first powers of Apsu and Tiamat, the father god and the mother goddess of everything that exists. What makes Nabu special is that he was a royal baby born from a human mother, an earthling queen connecting us by blood with the gods forever. In Norse mythology, Njord is the god of the sea coast, wind, sailing, and fishing. He is part of the Valnir tribe of gods, along with his daughter Freya and son Freyr, from his first wife Nerthus. The Valnir are the gods of prosperity, harvest, and fertility, and they were given to the Aesir as hostages to keep the peace between the warring Aesir and Valnir gods. There is evidence based on place names mainly in Norway and Sweden, that show there were cults and worship of Njord. Those who worship Njord would likely have given thanks to him for safe sea travel and for the fish that they had caught. It was said that Njord was still being thanked by fishermen in Scandinavia as late as the 1800s for bountiful catches. He is honored today in modern heathenry and is fondly thought of as being a generous, diplomatic and fatherly god. Nuada is one of the more significant members of the Tua de Dunan, yet he is, perhaps, overlooked in the modern pantheon. Nuada is a deity of the cycle of kingship, honorable behavior, battle, justice, and possibly healing if we credit some of his wider associations. The Tua de Dunan were not always in Ireland, but came as settlers among several such waves of invasion. When they did arrive, they were led by Nuada who was king of the Tuna Dadanum at the time, and had been, according to law, for seven years. 
He may also be a god associated with rivers, particularly the Boyne. He has a lot to offer modern polytheists who reach out to him and seems very present today to those who seek to connect to him. The Allfather, the one-eyed mystery who wanders the land seeking knowledge and offering wisdom, but also a Norse god of complexity. Odin is a being who is also wrapped up in modern day conversations and interpretations. The sources for information on Odin are conflicting at best and inspirational for many. With names meaning inspired, raging or mad, Odin is also linked to being a poet and one who offers beauty as much as he offers fury. Odin is described as wearing black or blue in alignment with the colours of mourning in Icelandic tradition. In many pictures and stories, it is said he arrives with a large hat and cloak with a hood. Both of these items help to hide the missing eye and to offer him a sense of protection from the outside world. He is said to have grey hair, possibly a beard, and the lines of age and experience. What seems to be clear about Odin is that he was present in the beginning, in the creation of the world, according to Norse mythology, and the separation of the gods into the Aesir and the Volnir. He was there for the time of the Great War and the time of battles. Valhalla is Odin's hall, and it is where those who fell in battle were laid. Osiris is one of the best known of the gods of ancient Egypt, and yet also one of the most mysterious. Most of what we know of his mythology comes from allusions from the pyramid texts and a number of New Kingdom stele, or from the more narrative writings of Plutarch and Diodorus Siculus during the Hellenistic period when the mystery cult of Isis and Osiris was well established. Osiris is best known as the Lord of the Underworld and of the dead, but his cult was also strongly associated with fertility and the regeneration of vegetation and with the annual flooding of the Nile. There are many versions of the myth of his death, mostly from Hellenistic sources, and it is difficult to be sure which, if any, is the original. Most involve his murder at the hands of his brother, his dismemberment and the search for the pieces of his wife and sister Isis. Puzuzu is a desert wind god from Mesopotamia, known for his evil and good nature. The earliest text that mentions Puzuzu is dated around 670 BC. The first image of him appeared in the royal tombs of Kalu towards the end of the 8th century BC. Many other images were found in Assyria, Babylonia and the west part of Iran. The meaning of Puzuzu's name might be twofold. The Neo-Assyrian Puzuzu occurs in a text from Tel Halaf and is explained as deriving from the Aramaic Puzozar, which means made of fine gold. The second might be from the word Pesul, which in Babylonian meant halt or dwarf. This could be the reason he has very small legs on one amulet and in the inscription calls himself Ugu'u, meaning cripple. Artifacts discovered throughout history reveal that Puzuzu was regarded as a god not a demon, as he has often been labelled. An Israeli museum contains an image of Pazuzu with horns around the top of his head, just like the crowns that adorn the well-known gods such as Ishtar. Most everyone has some awareness of Pegasus, the winged horse of Greek myth, but for many, he is no more than a fairy tale figure like the unicorn or a decorative symbol on a logo. However, Pegasus has a surprisingly rich network of relationships with other deities and associations with a diversity of skills and attributes. According to Greek myth, Pegasus is the offspring of Medusa and Poseidon. Pegasus seems to have been an eager servant of Zeus, pulling chariots and carrying lightning bolts for him. He lived in the stables of Mount Olympus until Zeus finally rewarded him for his service by turning him into a star, which gave us the Pegasus constellation. Pegasus is surely due our thanks and honour today for bringing forth the waters which inspire the muses, but where would we be without their help? As a willing servant of both the gods and humans, he models the servitude that we observe in horses everywhere.
He was the god of the wind, air, learning, and was associated with the planet Venus and the dawn. He was also the god of merchants and of arts and crafts. Since his iconography was often found in populated cities, he also became known as a god of civilization and culture. He was credited with gifting humanity with books, the calendar, and maze, and is sometimes credited with the powers of death and resurrection. He was a god of the people, comparable to Hephaestus, who brought humans fire, and Odin, who brought humans the runes. He was one of the most benevolent and easygoing of the Aztec deities, according to some sources, only requiring one human sacrifice per year. Some sources suggest he only accepted animal sacrifices. To the Aztecs, this was unusual in a deity. Set was one of the most ancient of the Egyptian gods. He was the focus of the Egyptian people's worship since the pre-dynastic period. The earliest representation of Set was found on a carved ivory comb from the Amration period. A storm god, he was associated with frightening events such as eclipses, thunderstorms and earthquakes. The glyph that represents him is within the Egyptian words for confusion, storm, rage, illness and turmoil. Set was identified with many animals, including the scorpion, crocodile, serpent and jackal. It was believed that certain fish were sacred to Set, especially the oxyrhynchus and the Nile carp. He often appeared with red hair and has been called the Lord of the Desert and the Ruler of the South. His name has been translated to mean destroyer and instigator of confusion. Shiva, like most Hindu gods, is depicted with blue skin to show his divinity, and in many paintings, he is depicted as sitting cross-legged and holding up his hand in a position known as the Obada Mudra, which means do not fear. His flowing hair is partly tied in a bun, from which the water of the Ganges flows down, and he is adorned with animal skins, which symbolize his ability to conquer all foes, regardless of their strength. He is also often depicted with his animal companions, Nandi, the sacred bull, and Vasuki, the world's first cobra. The Celts had their god of the storms, Taranus the Thunderer, who is lesser known, but no less fierce. He was known in the Rhineland and Danube areas, Gaul and into Dalmatia as well as Britain. Taranus was associated with fire, with the lightning and its voice the thunder. It was said he flung his wheel through the storm clouds, creating the lightning and the sparks of its passage. Willow trees were associated with Taranus, and modern magical practitioners use willow wands in weather magic. Wicker is also made of willow branches. Egrets, who nest in willow trees, and other marsh birds were also associated with Taranus and Essus as well. Tatkim is an Inuit god of the moon, hunting and reincarnation. The moon is his partially burnt out torch that he carries to light his way as he constantly and lecherously chases his sister, the sun goddess Sekinek. The story of how they came to be the moon god and the sun goddess demonstrates a little of the way of life led by the Inuit people as well as the beliefs that were important to them. In addition to his role as a moon god, he plays a very significant role in the Inuit cycle of reincarnation. The goddess Tapasuma instructs Tatkim to transport them to Earth, further instructing him as to what type of life form each soul should be reborn as. Tatkim takes the souls to Earth in his divine dog sled, pulled by four huge dogs or just one huge dog in some stories. When he is undertaking this role, the knight is moonless. Thor is the god of thunder and protector of mankind, who was, and remains, one of the most popular deities from Norse mythology. He is the son of Odin, the chief god in the Norse pantheon, and the goddess Jord, whose name translates as Earth. 
The mythology presents Thor as a god of many contradictions. For example, Thor is sometimes presented as a tactician, outthinking his enemies, while at others he can appear oblivious and is duped by fairly obvious, although primarily magical, means. Thoth, also known as Jehodi, holds the universe together by its orbits, systems, galaxies, and all the created space. He is self-created in many accounts, or born of the head of Set and the seed of Horus in others, roughly correspondent to Hermes and by extension Mercury. He is called Hermes Trismegistus, or Thoth, the thrice great. His seat is Hermopolis, still acknowledged in art and education, he appears on the logo of the University of Cairo, holding a stylus and a tablet. That depiction recognizes Thoth's creation of writing and magic, the art of spelling being a magical skill, along with the art of magic and spellmaking. Thoth encompasses the wisdom and power of the moon. He can be celebrated as a moon god, along with Khonsu, with whom he marked out time with the moon phases. This stove god, or kitchen god, is known by many names. Tosar Wang, Zhao Chun, Zhao Shen, Tosao Chun, and he is a very important domestic god that protects the hearth of the home and the family that lives within it. He is responsible for their happiness and their good fortune, but this isn't given freely. Over the course of a lunar year, Tosar Wang watches over the affairs of the family what they do and say, what their values, morals and behaviours are, and all of this is noted firmly within his memory and written down by his wife and stored away until a week before the Chinese New Year or the 23rd day of the 12th lunar month. This is a very important time for the family, but this is when Tu Sa Wang will ascend to heaven to verbally deliver his report on the family to the Jade Emperor, also known as Yu Huang who is one of the most important gods in Taoist tradition. Taoism is a Chinese philosophy that signifies the true nature of the world. Their thoughts and beliefs focus on genuineness, longevity, health, immortality, vitality, and they live in harmony with nature and the universe. Sosano is the bad boy of Japanese mythology, infamous for his mischievous and sometimes destructive behaviour, and has a reputation as being something of a trickster. Also known as Takeya Somo no Nikato, he is the Shinto god of the sea and storms, and the brother of Amate Lasu, the goddess of the sun, and of Tuskayomi, the god of the moon. In Japanese art, Sosano is often depicted with wild hair blowing in the winds, wielding a sword and fighting the eight-headed monster Yamata no Olochi. He also plays an important role in modern online gaming as a sort of anti-hero. Not to be confused with Anubis, Wepawet was originally a war god from Upper Egypt and his name means opener of the way. He was depicted as a jackal, or as a jackal-headed man, sometimes carrying a mace and bow, suggesting that he opens the way before the king in battle, since his image is frequently depicted atop the standard that led the armies, with the Koba Ureus of Wajet in front of him, a prominent deity dating back to pre-dynastic times. He held pride of place in the Egyptian religious order, the customary and regular representations on a range of royal objects bear testimony to his important association with pharaohs down the millennia. Wepawet played many roles and was venerated not merely as a funerary god, but also as one who assisted the king, not only in warfare, but when he celebrated the Hebsed Jubilee Festival too. The historical beginnings of Yahweh have been lost to us, but many scholars have concluded that he was originally a warrior god, worshipped in Median in present-day Jordan. For the faithful, however, Yahweh is eternal and has existed since the distant and mysterious beginning. From his word and will alone, 
He brought order from chaos, set into motion the mechanism of time, and crafted the earth and life in all its many forms. But we are not actually introduced to Yahweh in the Bible until the book of Exodus, when he appears to Moses in the form of a bush that burns but is not consumed. When asked for his name, Yahweh reveals to Moses the four Hebrew consonants, Yahweh, I am who I am, and instructs him to use that name when sharing his word with the Israelites. Whether Yahweh was once a pagan god, an amalgamation of gods, or wholly unique to the Israelites, it is impossible to overstate his importance in the development of the modern world. Wars have been fought, nations have been conquered, and lives have been forever altered under the banner of Yahweh. Perpetually angry and unreasonably violent, Yam was the powerful Canaanite god of the sea and rivers. He was the turbulent sea that crushed ships and pulled men down into a watery grave. He was the swollen river that burst from its banks, swallowing crops and strangling livestock with his unwavering grasp. His home was beneath the waves, in the depths of the primordial waters, and so he was also the untamed chaos present from the beginning of time. He was both feared and revered, not only among the Canaanites, but the Phoenicians and Egyptians as well. It is unquestioned that Yam was a brutal and rigid deity who abused his power and his fellow gods. But for the Canaanites, he was just another aspect of an uncontrollable world. He could sink ships or see them safely to port. He could flood the fields or entice them to grow. By venerating Yam, the Canaanites hoped to win his favor and avoid his wrath. The king of all the gods. Zeus is probably the most recognized god today after Yahweh and Allah. Having survived through the age of the monotheistic gods by blasting his thunderbolts from the texts of the classical Greek myths. As a god of the air, Zeus ruled everything in and under the sky, including the sun, moon, the planets, and the stars. His name means brightness of the sky and was the force of nature that brings storms and floods to the parched farming lands, and rains to replenish springs and rivers while hurling thunderbolts at his enemies and those who disobeyed his wishes. Upset him at your peril. And that's our brief introduction to 54 Pagan Gods. Thank you so much for watching. You can learn more with our book, Naming the God. A massive thank you and shout out to all the Moon Books authors that provided words for this video. You can find links to their books in the description below. Let us know which god you are currently working with, subscribe and ring the bell for weekly content, and we'll see you next time.